Today is Wednesday of the week where over the weekend we will celebrate Memorial Day weekend. For many, it's simply the start of summer. But for those of us who love freedom, who have a sense of history and perspective, and have great respect for our persons who have gone before, uh, there's a more important meaning. It's a meaning that's connected to freedom and to those who have gave, given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. During our service this week, we pause to remember them, to honor them, and to say thank you for the great and ultimate sacrifice. We also pause this week to remember persons who are in military service, women and men, to give thanks for our veterans, and to pray for our nation and the world. I invite you to join me as we celebrate this Memorial Day week and weekend. Welcome to Community Church. My name is Reverend Dale Brown, and it is my privilege to welcome you to worship in the name of Jesus Christ as we begin summer, but more importantly, celebrate Memorial Day weekend. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, the Bible reminds us that you order the nations and the world and its people, and that you are greater than all of these. And so we pray to you today, giving thanks for this great nation. We are not a perfect people. We are still in process moving towards a better union, a union based on compassion and understanding and equality. But I must say with all my heart that there is no better place to live, no greater people, no greater home. And that is true because of the sacrifice of so many. We come on this Memorial Day weekend to remember the sacrifice of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for freedom, thinking not of themselves or of selfish desire or wish. They found something greater and more important, worthy of their lives, and that is the freedom of themselves and others. And so we pause today to give thanks on this Memorial Day weekend for those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for this great nation and we give more honor greater honor to the Christ who loves us whose sacrificial death on the cross has purchased for us freedom from sin for eternity and our place in heaven all this we pray in the name of our Christ giving thanks amen Ever found comes like 
My name is John Falcone. Please hear now the text for today, Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. A vision of God in the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and then the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphats were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphats flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of thongs. The seraphat touched my mouth with it and said, Now this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That was great. Join me now as we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples and all people to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart prove acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. 
on that. Many years ago, I was at a theater in Wilmore, Kentucky. I was working on my doctoral degree at Asbury Theological Seminary. Just so you know, I'm not Dr. Brown. I'm ABD, all but dissertation. I did all the classwork. I just never wrote my dissertation. Life and other things got in the way. But we had decided as a class to go see the movie Saving Private Ryan together. And I can remember sitting in that theater and two or three things were happening around me. Number one, there were lots and lots of men, predominantly men in this setting, who were there, who I assume were World War II veterans. Maybe they were there on D-Day, I don't know, but I could tell by their hats and some of the other things that they wore that they were honoring their service to this great nation in World War II. Another thing that was happening is that there were lots of persons who were there who were interested in history, who wanted to see if the movie would reflect what they perceived the reality to be. And the third thing was my class was there. And there were 15 or 20 of us that were in that class, and we were sitting all in a row from one side of the middle section of the theater to the other. I am was seated somewhere in the middle of that classroom group. Somewhere in the middle of the theater. I like to sit in the middle so I can see everything and don't miss anything. And I was not aware of the profound reality, the profound impact this movie would have on me. You see, I like history. I like the study of history. I'm particularly interested in the period of time around the American Revolution and the American Civil War. Abraham Lincoln is a huge hero to me. I even, just to honor him at Christmas time, found a pair of Abraham Lincoln socks, which I bought and wear on occasion. But we were watching this movie which portrayed D-Day, the invasion of Europe to rid the world of the problem of the evil caused by Nazi Germany. And the portrayal of the invasion was quite, quite graphic, quite dramatic. And being a guy, I had to sit through this because, you know, I had to be brave. I had to not be overwhelmed, but it was all that I could do as someone watching a dramatic portrayal of what happened. I am not a, a person interested in war, but someone who as a follower of Jesus believes in peace, peace with justice, which I know means sometimes a just war, but I watched as persons who I knew at that point in time in reality would have been someone's son or husband or cousin or relative were killed or horribly maimed or injured. I don't know what D-Day was like. I can only assume that this was a realistic portrayal. Most of the time with veterans, they don't want to talk about this type of thing. And I can certainly understand why. For me, the, the great part of the movie was at the end of the movie. I love the movie, and I've seen it several times since, and it always has that impact on me. When the Private Ryan, the actor portraying Private Ryan as a senior adult, as an older man, comes back to that cemetery there where all the crosses and stars of David are lined up and all those service men and women are buried and he salutes the cross for his captain. And he says to his wife and family, tell me that I have been a good man, that I've led a good life, that I've been worthy of their sacrifice. 
On this Memorial Day weekend, week for us as we tape on Wednesday, I think that's a question that is important for all of us to ask. Have we been good people? Have we lived good lives? Have we been the type of people that please God in the midst of a time of crisis and heartache? And I think the most humble among us would answer, we've done our best, we've tried hard, we've worked at it. We've not been perfect, but we keep trying. And for most of us, I believe that's true. When we come out of the COVID pandemic and out of the, all the, the violence that's been a part of America over the last several months, as we go through this time of crisis, this time of angst, when we really don't know quite what to do or what to think or what to say, so many things seem to be changing and seem to be different. We need good people, don't we? People who consider the well-being of those who are most vulnerable, those who are different, of police officers, of all kinds of people, and who endeavor to be good. And good carries with it an understanding of living well in relationship to others, but also caring with compassion for those who struggle, those who are ill, those who are lonely. And being good in my understanding of faith carries with it a deep and abiding commitment to Jesus Christ, who it shows us and models for us what good really looks like. We need to be good people, as the actor portraying Private Ryan indicates. But I also believe that there's another question that we have to ask on this, and the answer is more difficult, perhaps even more personal, and it comes out of this text that John read uh, for us, John Falcone, from the writings of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is a young man, soon to be a prophet, and King Uzziah, his king, dies. It was a time of political and religious and national instability. There was concern because the king had died and for the rightful transfer of leadership and power. And Isaiah has a vision, a vision of God in heaven and God's hem and clothing fill the temple. Isaiah's vision is of the holiness, the greatness, the awesomeness, the power of God, a vision of God as big and great and huge, a vision of God's power and strength of God's ruling over the world. And seraphs who are angel winged creatures with six wings flew and shouted out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. And the pivots, the foundation of the thresholds of that temple shook with God's greatness. Isaiah's passage reminds us that while we think the nations have permanence and are lasting, it is God who has put the nations in place. It is God who rules the nations and who rules the world. That while our nation is great and strong, God is greater, God is stronger. Isaiah is made aware of his sin, his failing, in contrast to the holiness of God. And as he becomes aware of that sin, he seeks forgiveness for being unclean and 
one of the seraph flies and takes a live coal from the altar and puts it to his lips and Isaiah's guilt is blotted out and removed. Then here's the question. We, Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? Over the history of this great nation, many persons have heard that question. It's been asked in times of national crisis, in times of great fear and anxiety. It's been asked of persons in the life of the church, whether that means to teach a Sunday school class or to teach a nursery class or to serve as a pastor. Who will go? Who shall God send? God's call is on each one of us. And that call, I believe, this weekend is to be a good citizen, as Private Ryan's movie indicates, but even more than that, to be a good citizen who is a person of faith, who hears God's call and responds to God's call. It's so easy to say, send someone else. Let another person go. I'm too busy. I'm not interested. I don't want to. I don't have time. Throughout our nation, women and men have given of themselves in ways that require sacrifice. And sometimes that sacrifice means coaching a local Little League team or visiting someone in a nursing home, it doesn't necessarily mean going overseas, even though it can. God calls us to task daily, tasks of service and compassion and acts of love that make this world, our nation, we as a people better. And it makes our place of living even better. I am, I know that there are others who hear a call to service in the military service of this great nation. Several families over almost now 30 years of ministry I have sat with who look back and have lost loved ones. Some in World War II, uh, one family lost a a son as he flew across the channel of England and towards Europe. Another who lost a family member, a brother, a husband, a son on Iwo Jima. And others in more recent times of service, Vietnam, the war on terror, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Operation Freedom. For each of these, that sacrifice is as raw as it was the day it happened. And yet there is a great sense of pride because they heard that question, who shall I send who will go for us? Us as a people, us as a way of living called democracy. And they responded, with a willingness to give the ultimate sacrifice for us. Their commitment was to ideals higher and greater than self, a commitment to be willing to die for others. Memorial Day weekend reminds us that freedom is costly, that there is no free freedom that Someone has purchased it, someone has paid the price, and that we who remain are called to live with dignity and integrity because we honor them by how we live, by who we are, by what we say, and even by the way our culture is. When I look around and I look at TV and I look at things that are happening, I'm not so sure that we're honoring them enough. 
or appropriately or well. And also we honor today and we respect with great admiration those who have served this nation and came home. Some disabled. Most came back, as Tom Brokaw wrote in his book, The Greatest Generation, to lead this nation into a time of prosperity we could never, ever have imagined. I'll tell you one story very quickly. I had a dear friend who was a airplane gunner on a bomber in World War II. He was from Bridgeville, Delaware, and he was a humble man who came back home after being a prisoner of war in World War II. At age 18, he went into the service. At age 21, he was flying in a mission over Leipzig, Germany, when his plane was hit and everyone bailed out and only he of the plane crew survived. He said that when he parachuted out, he was coming down for some reason, I guess maybe because of the force of the jump, his shoes flew off. And he spent the next several months walking from place to place around Germany because there was no place to house these prisoners of war. He walked barefoot throughout the winter. He had just a little bit of bread daily to eat. And he came home having survived that ordeal to marry, to raise a son and two daughters, to work at a job that he loved and to live into his 90s. I knew him when he was in his early 80s. And the first time I really sat down with him, he showed me all of his plane models. And he talked about his service. And he talked about his time as a prisoner of war but he talked about it in a way that was very humble, that drew attention not to himself, but to those whom he served with. And he said, you know, I'm a tough man. And I believed him because he had to be tough to survive what he went through. Here in Community Church, we had a gentleman who was known to us as Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken Lewis. Ken, at about the same age, was at the Battle of the Bulge where he was taken prisoner and held for some time, he came back to be an attorney, a husband, a father. You see, these persons, when the time demanded, heard that question, whom shall we send? And they said, here I am, send me. I think today that question is sent to each one of us. When God asks us and invites us and calls us to use our gifts to serve the church or the community or others in some way, he asks us, whom shall I send? And we are challenged to say, here I am, send me. Our response makes all the difference. It makes a difference to us. It makes a difference to our communities. It makes a difference in small ways added together to our world. I hope that you hear God's call today. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And we say, here I am, send me out of respect and admiration for the example of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice, for our veterans, for those who are continuing to serve in, on active duty, for the, out of respect for those who serve in our community in a variety of ways, and, of, and out of love for one another, for God, for our world. When called, let us serve in their honor, in their memory, knowing that our service and their service, when added together, can make all of us 
into a better and greater people. I hope that you have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. I hope that you spend time doing something more than simply taking a day off and celebrating the start of summer. I hope that all of us consider and count the cost of what it means to be free and to know that we walk in the footsteps of giants who gave for us the ultimate sacrifice, who paid the price of freedom. We come to a time in our service where we want to pray for those who are a part of the life of this church, our families, our community, and our world. But we also want to recognize those who are giving their lives and who gave their lives for our freedom. My grandfather was Pop Hill. And Pop died when I was a young man, probably 12 or 13, and it was the first funeral that I participated in. Little did I know that as a pastor I would participate in many, many more. His real name was Joseph Gordon Hill. And he was born in western Pennsylvania and emigrated with his family to the eastern shore of Maryland, stopping in Stockton, Maryland. We don't know why Pop came in this direction, and we don't know why he stopped in Stockton, but we think it might have been because he ran out of money there. He became a tenant farmer and a truck driver, and he became someone who was the husband of Dolores Brittingham Hill, my grandmother, and also the father of six children. Prior to all of this, he was a soldier. In World War I, Pop was all over France as an American doughboy. When we were going through the attic cleaning out things after Pop and Mom uh, sold the farm and after Pop had died and was moving Grandma into town, we found his helmet and his gas mask. And as a little boy, that was the biggest thing that I could find or see or have. And so I have my grandfather's World War I helmet and gas mask. But more than that, I have a legacy in my family between my grandfather and now my father of service to this great nation. I am very proud to be an American. I don't for one moment believe us to be a perfect people, but I believe us through democracy to be the best place to live and to continue to work on treating everyone well, fairly, and equally. We are still on that journey. And because we are people, fallible people, we will always be on that journey. This is home for me, and I am proud to be from here and to live here. I'm even perhaps more proud because of the example of persons like my grandfather and my dad who were in the U.S. Army. And I'm thankful today for all persons who served in the armed forces of this great nation, be that in Vietnam, Korea, World War II. I haven't met a World War I veteran for a long time because most of them are deceased. And even in times of service more recently, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and Operation Freedom. These are women and men of honor and integrity, and we salute them this day. What I invite you to do is to join me in a time of prayer. And we will have a moment of silence to remember the honored dead, to pray for veterans, to pray for those on active military service and their families, and to remember that freedom is very, very costly. 
and we don't negate or we don't exercise our freedoms without thought and without a deep, deep and profound respect for those whose lives purchased this freedom for us. So let us begin as we honor the honored dead this Memorial Day weekend. So I invite you into a time of silent prayer with me. Eternal God, on this Memorial Day weekend, this time when we honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice and those who continue to sacrifice for this great nation, we pray, giving thanks for their memory. They are examples to us of commitment to higher ideals and higher standards and selflessness and self-sacrifice. And we desire to honor them who gave the ultimate sacrifice by how we live. And so help us today to be a nation of values and faith and ideals, a nation of equality for all persons, a nation where we love and respect one another even in the midst of our differences. Help us to put aside acts of violence where we uh, believe that we can solve our problems by harming another. And help us to live into the reality that these women and men who gave the ultimate sacrifice have exemplified for us. And gracious God, we do pause today and pray for our veterans, for men and women who serve this nation with distinction, with honor, with integrity. We thank you for them and we pray for them, whatever midst of conflict they serve. And we also pause today to pray for those who are continuing to serve this nation on active duty. Keep them safe. Bring them home quickly. We pray for their families and we ask that we as a nation might take up the care of our disabled veterans in a way that's more fitting and appropriate to their honor. We pray for our nation and its leaders and our world. May that prophecy from the Old Testament come true even more quickly that we will beat our swords into plowshares and that we will study war no more so that no one's son or husband or grandson or grandfather ever need be harmed in conflict again. Thank you for these veterans. Thank you for those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for Jesus who models for us what sacrificial love is all about. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In Flanders Field, in Flanders Field the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce herds amid the guns below. We are the dead Short days ago, we lived, felt down, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw. The touch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us, you die. We shall not sleep through poppies grow in Flanders Field.
Thank you for worshiping with us. Please take the opportunity to uh, wish a veteran a very happy Memorial Day weekend and to say thank you for their service to pray for the memory and honor of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice and to serve in a way that is appropriate uh, to that memory, to that honor. Let us pray together. May God so equip you with the Holy Spirit that you might more and more love God by obeying the commandments of Christ. Go in peace.